Hello, my lovely listeners. I'm Dr. Mary Barson. And I'm Dr. Lucy Burns. Welcome to this episode of Real Health Health and and Weight Loss. Gorgeous ones, Dr. Lucy here. Every Friday, I'm going to be interviewing an extra special expert in low carb. All of our experts are involved in the Low Carb Roadshow. The Low Carb Roadshow is a concept that Dr. Mary and I have founded where we are bringing low carb conferences to the people. We are traveling to most of Australia's capital cities. And this year's event is sponsored by Lacanto, who make non sugar sweeteners. For more information and to check out an event in your capital city, go to all the W's, Low Carb Roadshow. Com. Today's guest is presenting at Low Carb Perth on April the 23rd. He is an American doctor and is well renowned in the carnivore movement. So we thought we'd have a chat to him and hear his thoughts on carnivore. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Anthony Chafee. Anthony, it is so good to have you on the podcast. I'm thrilled and I'm sure our audience is going to be super keen to hear about you, your story and the carnivore movement. So I thought we'd start with perhaps just a little introduction so you can tell our listeners about yourself and how you've come to be where you are. Oh, yeah. Well, thank you very much for having me. I'm, I'm looking forward to it as well. Well, I'm, I'm an American doctor. I grew up in California and then have lived pretty much everywhere since then, all over US and in Europe and now Australia. I am currently a neurosurgical registrar, but I've also had a a very keen interest in diet and nutrition and how that affects health and chronic disease and specifically athletic performance since I was I was a teenager and actually before my my undergraduate degree in university. I always played sports and I was um, a top level rugby player in the US and played at a professional level in the US and England. And I just wanted to know how to fuel my body properly. So I was always very interested in that and also wanting to be a doctor in the future that just, you know, fit very well with what I wanted to learn about. So I came around this way of eating about 23 years ago now, when I was taking cancer biology at the University of Washington in Seattle. And we were learning just how you know, plants were toxic. And uh, the reason they were is by design. They use these defense chemicals to deter animals from eating them and insects as well. And some of these can be quite carcinogenic. So we were learning that from a carcinogen point of view, from a cancer point of view, because it was a cancer biology class. And we learned right away that things like Brussels sprouts had 136 identified human carcinogens in them, and that mushrooms had over 100 carcinogens in them. But that all the other vegetables that we eat and we find in the grocery store, like spinach and broccoli and kale, they all have dozens uh, of carcinogens as well. We were very taken aback by this. I remember thinking to myself, like, how can how can this be? Like, can this be? Are, yes. Yeah, and uh, you know, because you're, you're you're drilled into this is drilled into you since birth uh, that you know that just vegetables are, are just the best things for you. And and I remember thinking in my head, I was like, well, but aren't they still good for you though? Even though I'm just you know learning all this. Mm-hmm. And my professor just looked at us. He must have read our minds because he just looked at us and he just said, I don't eat salad. I don't eat vegetables. I don't let my kids eat vegetables. Plants are trying to kill you. And so I said, okay, stop eating plants. And I, you know, I went to the grocery store and absolutely everything had plants included in it, some sort of ingredient or seasoning or just enti- the entirety was some sort of plant or grain. And I just was walking around like, oh my God, what do I eat? And I passed by some eggs. I was like, okay, eggs, they don't come from a plant. Meat, meat doesn't come from a plant. And so I just defaulted into a carnivore diet because I just did not want to eat plants. And years and years later, I then realized the significance of that because actually at the time that my health entirely changed. It wasn't like I was an unhealthy person. I was an all-American rugby player playing at a prof- you know, top professional level in America. But, you know, I, and so I felt amazing. I was already feeling good, but this, this just went next level. I just, I just felt superhuman and my body just was able to do things that just no one else could do that I wasn't able to do previously. And so it just really, really changed everything. And it wasn't until, you know, many years later that it clicked for me and said, wait, hold on. Humans actually are carnivores. That's what all the best evidence shows that we've been carnivores. Our ancestors have been carnivores going back two to three million years. And 
when an animal eats what it evolved to eat, what it's biologically appropriate species specific diet is, they do better. You know, as anybody, any zookeeper can tell you, you feed an animal something that it doesn't eat in the wild, something that it didn't evolve on, it can get sick and they get what's called human diseases like diabetes and heart disease and cancer and autoimmune diseases. And this is why there are signs at the zoo and signs at the park saying, don't feed the animals. This makes them sick. And we don't realize that, you know, they're saying, don't feed the animals, the thing you're eating. It makes them sick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sick too. And and that's what we don't, don't realize. And so that, that clicked for me later on that, wait, hold on. I, I was living as a carnivore. I was eating as a carnivore. That's what was making the difference. And so at that point, I, I really started digging into the literature and saying, okay, what, what do we know? What can we prove? And what, what else do we need to show? So uh, that's what I've been doing and trying to incorporate that into my practice because I, I just see this help so many people reverse very serious ailments because, you know, as I've sort of alluded to, I don't think these human diseases are actually diseases. I think that they're from eating the wrong things sort of toxicities and malnutrition. And you can even go back further. You can go back a hundred years, 200 years, 500 years. And you can see that these diseases were certainly not as prevalent as they are now, but they, you know, most of them were known about and they were called diseases of the West because indigenous population, the European explorers came to did not get them. And so the Australian Aboriginals, the Native Americans, and other populations that just ate meat, as we have been doing for millions of years, they did not get these Western diseases. Now we call them just human diseases because everybody gets them because everyone's eating this way. And now animals are getting human diseases. And vets are saying now that domestic pets, there's an increased prevalence in human diseases as well. And that's because we're feeding them more of the same nonsense that we're eating. Oh, absolutely. And in fact, I think probably the rate of, you know, type 2 diabetes in cats and dogs is just astronomical. But yeah, uh, it's fascinating. So 23 years ago, you would have been considered, you know, a weirdo, like nobody would be eating the way you were. What? How did you manage that? Didn't you get bombarded with people going, oh my God, you're so unhealthy? Yeah. You know, that, that's the funny thing is that because I wasn't thinking about it, so no one else thought about it. That no one cared. I, I, I think back on that. I mean, because I was doing that for years and years and years. No one said a thing, not a single thing. Because I just said, well, I don't want to eat plants. I never talked about it. I just did it, you know? And so, like, you know, you're at the dinner table. There's always meat there anyway, at least in my house. And that's all I wanted to eat anyway. And I was an adult now. So my parents couldn't force me to eat vegetables. And so, I would just grab the meat and that's it. And and I wasn't, you know, preaching to anyone saying, oh my God, you don't want to do that. Plants are trying to kill you or anything like that. It was just very, very firmly stuck in my head. And and so that's what I did. And so when it would be a dinner and there would be there would be meat on the table, I would just I would just get the meat. I would just eat the meat. And when I was cooking for myself, I just ate meat. And and that was fine. You know, it, it never really came up. Then when I was doing this consciously, say, oh, no, the, okay, this is this is really what it is. You really shouldn't eat it because we're carnivores and because of all this. And I was like, okay, that makes sense now. Well, then I was conscious about it and I was a little self-conscious about it. And so then it came up, we're, we're at restaurants and I'm like thinking, I'm like, oh, they're going to think I'm weird or something like that. It's like, you've been doing this for 20 years. Like, who cares? You know, no one has cared so far. Yeah, 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 and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and then you're sort of there and you're sort of self-conscious and then you feel, you feel, you know, the need to talk about it. So, well, this is why I'm doing it and whatever. And, and then people are like, oh, okay. But then they'll talk about it. Maybe they'll be interested. Maybe they'll think you're weird. A lot of the times, you know, if you have the arguments and they understand it, go, oh, okay, all right. That sort of makes sense. And, you know, a lot of people have come to a carnivore way of eating or at least eating more meat just because of those conversations that I've had with them. But, you know, it, it was really just because I was felt a little self-conscious early on that I felt the need to justify what I was doing. Whereas before I just didn't care. I was just like, I was like, Oh no, not eating plants. And so, and so which now, is, um, I was going to say embodies one of our favorite lines, which is eating is not a team sport. Yeah, yeah. It's an individual pursuit. Yeah. You just, you do you, they do them. But, and I can see that worked really well, but it's it's interesting, isn't it? Because as you learn more and more about it, you, you know, we feel this. And it, sometimes it feels like a complete obligation to just let people know what's actually really going on. Yeah. And the thing is too, you're right, that when I, when I learned more about it and learned actually how important this was to eat this way and just the, the improvements that I was getting were specific to that way of eating, 
I felt that I wanted to share that. I felt that I wanted other people to know about it so that they could improve their life as well. Whereas, you know, 20 years ago, I'm like, oh, yep, no, plants are trying to kill me. I'm not going to do that. But I I didn't really understand to the extent that I do now just what that meant and just how serious and important that was. And so now I think that it is important. And I think that people deserve to know these sorts of things as well, which is, you know, why I I, I talk about these things with people and why I started my, my podcast and YouTube channel because I just wanted to sort of get the information out there to people so they could do what they want with it. Like, I I really don't mind what people eat. I don't care if they smoke or they drink. I I don't, I really don't care. I I don't care what adults choose to do with their own bodies, but I would like them to know about it. You know, like just back in, you know, you know, whatever, 50, 70, hundred years ago, you know, when doctors, you know, nine out of 10 doctors choose camel or something like that, you know, it's just like, they're it's like, it's good for you. I, you know, I don't care if people smoke. I'd like them not to because I'd like them to be healthy, but I just don't want them to think they should smoke because it's good for them. You know, like, oh, I don't really like this, but I guess I'll have to, you know, like eating, you know, a bunch of vegetables, you know, and, and if you want to eat vegetables, like go for it. But I don't want them to feel obligated to if they don't want to and to at least understand uh, that the dietary recommendations that we've had aren't actually necessarily as good for you as, as we thought they were. Oh, well, we, we certainly know that and that the vested interest groups have sort of, you know, been able to weasel their way in and make enormous impact, kind of like with people just offline not even realising. So, yeah, it's certainly a problem. Now, one of the questions I've got, though, so you your brain was tweaked when the lecturer said, you know, they're, they're carcinogens, they're trying to kill you. How do you marry that up with then, you know, when people go, but red meat's a carcinogen, it's bad for you? What's your argument with that? Well, I, I guess you have to look at, at the evidence and reasons why, you know, I mean, the carcinogens in plants have been cataloged and, and named and everything like that. Like, you know, people say that, well, red meat in general is a carcinogen. It's like, okay, what chemicals in red meat are carcinogenic? They can't answer that. They say, well, there's this association with homocysteine. Okay, the, what chemical causes cancer in red meat? You know, they don't have an answer for that. Whereas there was 136 individually identified chemicals in, in Brussels sprouts 22, 23 years ago, right? So these are things that you can put on paper saying this name, this name, this name, this name, this name. And this is, this is not a secret. I mean, the WHO, which, which pushes a plant-based agenda, they have a whole website dedicated to natural toxins and carcinogens in food. And if you go there, you will see that every single one is a plant, fungus, or algae. None of them are meat, not a single one. They, the red meat does not make that list. Oh. It is all plants. And they say specifically in there, these can be toxic, these can be deadly, these can be mutagenic, these can be carcinogenic. And so this is actually well known and well established in botany and biology. These are hard sciences. This is not the soft science of nutritional medicine, which is, like you say, eminently corrupted from different corporations and different food interests. And also originally, I mean, the original study of dietetics uh, started in about 1917 with the Seventh Day Adventists, who have a religious fundamental belief that meat it causes lust and is therefore sinful. So they're saying on a religious point that meat is bad for you, and now they're trying to, you know, really corrupt the data to say to show that well, scientifically, no, 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 meat really is bad for you. This is a, a, a religious agenda. This is not actual science. In fact. Absolutely. And in fact, we have a podcast series that just came out from Belinda Fetke going through all of that. So I will link that in the show notes. But also, Anthony, I will link the WHO toxic plant website link so that if people want to look further into it, they can click just click in the show notes and it'll be in there. There's other institutions as well. There's there's other governmental bodies like the New Zealand uh, government, US government, all these sorts of things. They have websites looking at the toxic nature of plants. And in any especially in animal uh, agriculture and animal nutrition. Animal nutrition actually is a very robust science because, you know, with human models, you you can't really do a a randomized control trial with thousands of individuals in exactly the same situations throughout a lifetime, right? It's not ethical. It's not practical. You can do that with sheep. You can do that with mice. You can do that with goats. You can do that with cows. And so they actually have very, very strong scientific studies looking at 
how exactly do these things work? And there are many diseases, if you want to call them that, with names that are not like diseases that they caught from something. They are from eating something outside of their natural diet. And, you know, big head, limp neck, you know, crazy cow syndrome, all these things are specific to eating the wrong thing and they get poisoned because there's poisons and toxins in there and their body can't break them down and detoxify them properly and they get acute problems. And you can get some things that, are, that aren't as acute that over time will build up to arthritis and diabetes and things like that. And sorry, just to finish off with the, the red meat thing, the University of Washington in Seattle, they just published a large uh, literature review meta-analysis of the literature on all the studies looking at red meat and saying that it's carcinogenic or causes diseases and things like that. And they're like, these are weak, weak studies. This is lazy science. This is not good evidence. And they just critiqued all of it. And they found it's just like, look, there is no strong evidence to say that red meat causes cancer or is even associated with cancer. These are very poor studies, very poorly done. And they're, they're more you know, propaganda than, than science. And so that was just published earlier this year. And, um, you know, and, and I would agree with that. And if you read the studies that, you know, purport to show a link between red meat and cancer, you find that there's very weak associations, usually like 18%, whereas like any sort of epidemiological studies or like survey studies, I mean, this is, this is, has so many confounding factors in it that if it doesn't have a strong enough signal, like over 200% increased correlation, you really don't pay attention to it. And people don't realize that they're having studied statistics. So this is put off like, oh my goodness, there's this oh, increase in, in bowel cancer with red meat. No, this one study showed that there may be an increased association of 18%. So it's far less than 200%. And there's uh, many other confounding factors like, you know, we're, we're just being told that red meat's bad for you. So people avoid it. And the people who don't avoid it say, well, I don't care. I'm just going to live my life. I enjoy it. Well, what else do they enjoy? They enjoy smoking. They enjoy drinking. They enjoy driving fast. They enjoy extreme sports. So in that same category and group of people, these people are more likely to smoke, more likely to drink, more likely to die in a car accident, more likely to die in extreme sports. So they're like, oh, look, eating red meat is associated with all-cause mortality, all-cause mortality. So if you die in a plane crash, that has something to do with what you ate for dinner? You know, no, you know, and, and there's all these other factors that go into it that they do not account for because they're trying to show something that doesn't exist. And then when people have redone those studies and controlled for those variables, they found there's no link at all. And then the University of Washington looked at all the data and found that, yeah, this is nonsense. It's so interesting. And I think the other thing that sort of contributes to this is media who love a sensationalized clickbait or soundbite. And I remember, I think it was uh, last year, there was the study that showed there was an increased risk of type 2 diabetes in Chinese women who ate eggs. It's like, <laughs> what? And then when you went into the study, you realised it was eggs that were in anything. So eggs that were in cakes counted, right. <laughs> eggs that were in custard with sugar, all of that counted. And that was, and maybe the Chinese women are eating more cakes and custard but yeah, it, it was just rubbish. But, you know, again, media went, wow, oh, eggs cause type 2 diabetes. So it's really, you're right, it's so, um, it's so tricky to tease apart all of that. And, you know, for someone like me who, who does understand science, but I, I still get bogged down it. So the average lay person, it's, it is, it's really, really tricky. And I think we, you know, real life medicine, we spend a lot of time just sort of follow the money, you know, follow who's funding the group, who's funding the science as well, because that's also, you know, just another whole can of worms. Yeah, absolutely. And and, and you do have to look at that, you know, and, and unfortunately, some of these studies, while, you know, you're supposed to report who's funding the study and, and your conflicts of interest, they don't always. And that was, that's a bit of a scandal with all the studies looking at cholesterol, the original ones looking at cholesterol and saying that cholesterol was associated with heart disease and, and um, uh, the University of San Francisco, uh, UC San Francisco Medical School published in the Journal of American Medical Association, which is one of the top medical journals in the world back in 2016, actual internal memos from the sugar companies back in the 50s and 60s, detailing how they paid off three Harvard professors to falsify data and publish fraudulent studies to make it appear as if cholesterol caused heart disease. 
to exonerate sugar. And one of those professors was named head of the USDA. And he was the one who authored and published the 1977 USDA declaration that cholesterol causes heart disease. And that just shut down the conversation. There's a, there a heated debate in the literature people can go back to all the way back to the 1950s. I found a, a, a JAMA article from 1956, where this guy was it's like, you know, the intro was like, well, look, you know, a lot of people basically accepted that cholesterol causes heart disease, but this is based on very weak evidence. This is based on very poor studies. And, uh, and he just went through them. It was just 12 pages, just ripping these things apart. And so there's a very, very, very heated debate uh, about this going all the way up to 1977. Then it was just, oh, that's it. Teacher stepped in, teacher told us, nah, nah, I told you, and that's it. And it just shut it down. And we know that this was fraud. We know that this was fraudulent. And we know these people were bought and paid for. And they did not disclose that. They did not disclose that they were being paid by the sugar companies. They did not disclose that their studies were being funded by the sugar companies. We even have their contracts. We know what they were paid. $6,500. It's the equivalent of, of 50 grand now. That's what their souls were worth. That's what the, the, the health of the world was worth. You know, And people took those recommendations from the USDA on faith. The rest of the world followed suit. And what happened? You know, heart disease rates have tripled since then in every country that have do- adopted those measures. And, and all other chronic diseases and obesity have increased by at least that much, if not much more. Type 2 diabetes increased by a factor of six. And so you can't say that cholesterol and saturated fat cause heart disease when you, we've reduced it and people are, are getting worse, right? And we have, you know, that we've reduced our red meat consumption in America between 1970 and, and 2014 by 33%. And in that time, heart disease has tripled and you know our saturated fat and uh, cholesterol consumption has gone down uh, pr- um, proportionately as well. So there's certainly not a direct one-to-one link between eating saturated fat and cholesterol or red meat and heart disease and cancer because cancer rates have tripled, stroke rates have tripled, heart disease tripled, obesity has tripled, and all the rest have increased exponentially. So you know, it's something that we have to look back on and say, okay, this was based on fraud throw it out, start over again. Maybe cholesterol is linked. I mean, it's not, you know, I mean, there's tons of studies showing that it's not. There's randomized control trials with tens of thousands of people showing it's not, but you know, maybe it was, but you can't base it on that. You have to throw all that stuff out. You have to start over again. And that's not what people are doing. They're, they're still holding to that. And uh, that's what we need to undo. Absolutely. And again, you know, much like you know, fruit, fruit is healthy that it's people are just, it's like a firm fixed belief that they, it's not even in their radar to challenge that idea because it's so, it's like a given. It's like, well, you know, we need air to breathe. Fruit is healthy. And, um, you know, we, we now know that in particularly excessive fruit and the way our fruit has now been bred to be so much more palatable and with much more sugar in it. And I guess, you know, part of me thinks, well, it's a fruit industry have to compete with Mars bars. And so they're breeding these products for people to actually eat them. Yeah. And so it's always funny to me when they, when people say that, you know, like, well, it must be healthy because, you know, they wouldn't let people just say that fruit's healthy if, unless it was healthy. Who's they, you know? And, and, and they, he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, these benevolent, all knowing overlords that just, just look down and, you know, like it's just Jesus sitting there. No, 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 no. Can't say that. You know, it, these are people. These are people with their own limitations and their own conflicts. And they, you know, don't exist. You know, this is just, this, well, the government wouldn't let you do Well, governments actually, you know, not necessarily, you know, who you want to rely on. I mean, you just look, study history and realize that almost every government ever was the bad guy in throughout history. And, um, you know, just look at the 20th century and all the tens of millions of people who were killed and, in uh, different uh, holocausts and, and uh, things like that. So those were governments doing, that was them doing it. And so, because that's been, again, been drilled in us. So you have to eat fruit and vegetables, fruit and vegetables. Oh, they're so good for you. They're so good for you. You have to eat them. You have to eat them. And these are the government regulations. So, well, you know, they, they wouldn't say that unless it was true. Like, okay. They say a lot of things yeah, yeah. that aren't true. Yeah, yeah. And I think particularly in Australia, we have to be very mindful that Australia has a very big sugar industry. You know, Queensland is full of sugar cane. It is an integral part of their, of the government revenue. Well, there's no tax directly on sugar per se, but taxes that the sugar farmers pay just as part of their normal income, but also that the sugar lobby is heavily 
it's incredibly powerful and pays lobbies both sides of politics. So it makes it very difficult for one side to make a moral stand and go, no, we're not going to accept that because then the other side will just get double the money and buy the votes and bang, they're out. So, you know, a government does not want to lose power. That's their whole modus operandi is to stay in power and they'll do whatever it is to stay there. Yeah, that's that's very true. And, you know, that, you know, sort of makes the argument for, you know, I think a lot of people share is that probably shouldn't have lobbyists, you know, special interests, you know, paying uh, government officials to do their bidding. That was not something that that was done for a very long time in, in many countries. Like in America, there were 150 years that had no lobbyists. And because you couldn't actually, it was in the Constitution that you couldn't use government money for special interests. It was only things that, that for the common good, like, you know, c- you know, civil defense and, and things like that. And, uh, and then, you know, in, in the 1930s, they said uh, with FDR, they said like, oh, well, you know, if I help Adam, he's part of the community and he's going to go and do things that are good for the community. So that, that helps everyone really, you know, if I help you, that helps Absolutely. everyone. Yeah. Yeah. And that was their, that was their workaround for it. And, and because of that, then, you know, the budget in, in the U.S. Just, just went out of control because now they're just spending money on absolutely anything. And now you had these lobbyists come in because there was something to purchase now. Because if, if government officials don't have power, there's nothing they can sell. And so, you know, and now there was something to sell. And so now you have lobbyists come in there like, hey, here's a lot of money. Don't you think this would help people? Don't you think it'd be good for them to have you know, low cost sugar. I do think that actually, that's a great idea. Let's do that. You know, so. Absolutely. Well, it's interesting. I read an article that just on the weekend about the concept of food is, food is medicine, which is, you know, what, what I think you and I both believe. And they were talking in the States how now primary care physicians can prescribe food as medicine and they can write food prescriptions and their insurance companies will pay for that. But now, of course, you've got the problem of commercial interest groups coming in and going, oh, well, we'll we'll run this. And so they're now funding or they're providing the food in the food as medicine and it's meant to be whole food and not processed because their thing is about reducing ultra-processed food. And then these companies are just coming in and basically there's no, there's very little oversight on what they're providing. And a lot of the time it is just relabeled processed food. And it's like, ugh. So there's always, wherever there's money, there's bound to be corruption. But one of the things I'd want to move on to is to actually ask you, and people will be super keen to know, like, what do you eat on a carnivore diet? What do you do? How, how do you do it? Yeah. Well, you know, a lot of people think that just a carnivore diet is just eating more meat, you know, and, and then maybe eating a little bit less of other things. And, and that's really good. You know, I mean, eating meat is, is very, very good for you. That is, I believe, our biologically appropriate species specific diet. That's what gives us optimal health and nutrients. But, it, you know, it's not just that, you know, it's just, I think it's as important what not to eat as what to eat. And because obviously these, these plants and fungi and processed foods and all these sorts of things which all are processed with plants, really. You, even processed meats, you know, like salamis and things like that, they have spices and seasonings and sugar that all, all are derived from plants. But, you know, the plants themselves, these plants and fungus and things like that, they can cause harm. And so I think it's, it's really important to get away from those things. And obviously any artificial ingredients. So anything that didn't exist 50,000 years ago, you should not be putting in your body as far as food is concerned. Your medicine is a different story, clearly. But, you know, even if people say, oh, no, no, we were definitely eating plants. Well, first of all, we weren't. I mean, that's what all like the actual like hard science shows with things like the stable isotope studies going back before the agricultural revolution. We really weren't for millions of years. We were apex predators, top of the food chain. We really were just eating meat. Maybe we had some plants every now and then to you know stave off starvation if we were in trouble. But what crops were we growing in the ice ages? You know, that's just, that wasn't possible, right? So we were eating meat and that's, and that's you know, what we were doing. But either way, whether or not we were eating plants here and there, you know, what plants exist today that we were eating? Like none of them. They're all bioengineered and, and GMO hacked and things like that or, or, or hybridized in ways that are completely, take them completely away from what their natural form was. So none of these plants existed 50,000 years ago. So you, you know that you shouldn't be eating any of those things anyway. Meat existed. Animals existed. That's fine. And so a lot of people will eat a lot of meat, but they'll still 
have you know different sorts of things. They'll still use artificial sweeteners. Oh well, it's not carb, and, and and that's sort of the corruption of the ketogenic movement. Ketogenic in Atkins, these used to be whole foods. That's a really good first step is just whole foods. And then they were limiting out a lot of things and focusing more on meat and fat. And this conferred a lot of benefit. Now you have the sort of, well, as long as it doesn't have carbohydrates, well, then it's okay. And then you have all these artificial sweeteners and all these chemicals that got them put in to get that sweet flavor that people crave. You know, it's like imitation cocaine. You're like, don't just stop all together. Just stop. You're like, bath salts that they were doing. Well, it's not technically cocaine, so it's okay if I do it, right? Well, no, that's, that's not what that means. And so I think that's the same with food. And and so you know, I, I talk to people that say like, well, I did a carnivore diet and I felt a lot better and my autoimmune issues went away and all these different things happened, but I didn't really lose weight. So I stopped doing it because I, I guess it just didn't work for me. I wish it would have. I was like, Okay, well, it sounds like it was working for you. It sounds like you were doing Yes, yes, better. what is working, yeah. Yeah, and and also, what were you eating? What exactly were you eating? And that's always what I say, what exactly were you eating? And uh, there's, oh, no, I was just eating meat. I was just, no, 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 what exactly were you eating? Were you having any artificial sweeteners? Were you having coffee? Were you having this? We have, in fact, it turns out they were having a lot of that. And almost always they were having some sort of sweetener like stevia or monk fruit sugar or whatever, you know, uh, sweetener that they chose to use. And so it's like, okay, well, well, that can be why you went down. So a carnivore diet is really, you know, what a lion would eat, what a wolf would eat, what dolphins eat, what sharks eat. They eat animals. That's what they eat. And you can eat whatever animal that you like, uh, as long as you, you aren't afraid of the fat and you try to get enough fat, but that's what you're eating. You're just eating meat you're just drinking water. So my hard rule is I think of it as, you know, what not to eat. Yes, we eat meat. You can eat any meat, any animal, whatever you want, but no plants, no sugar, nothing artificial. And that goes for sauces, seasonings, and drinks as well. People don't realize it, it can actually make a serious difference. You know, people that have had you know, hereditary background where their ancestors were introduced to agriculture far earlier than other populations, like European populations, it's roughly 8,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago. Native Americans, Native Australians did not have that luxury. And so they didn't build up in their genetic stock the slight protections to these chemicals. I have a lady who's a, a Native American, Native um, Canadian. And a very nice lady. And she's from her own culture. They just eat meat. And most of them do. Not all of them do. But that's, you know, the, like the Inuit population. They just eat meat. And that's what they've done for forever. And so she was just eating meat because her daughter, you know, when they ate sort of Western foods, they would get, she would get very sick. So they just, you know, went back to traditional ways and were just eating meat. However, she was using spices, They're using spices and seasonings. And she was just carnivore, but just using spices and seasonings. And because she didn't have these protections that other people do, she was much more sensitive to them. And so she actually had a number of autoimmune diseases that she you know, suffered with. And she was in her 60s or is in her 60s. And you know, for 40 years, she's been dealing with these autoimmune issues. And then she joined my um, sort of 30-day challenge group of just really getting rid of everything except meat and water, salt to taste. And her autoimmune issues started clearing up. She's like, what the hell? It was just the spices were enough to set her off. And, you know, as we know here in Australia, the, the native uh, Aboriginal population is much more sick and unwell than any, anyone else from anyone else, uh, anywhere else. When I first got here, I was told straight away when you, and I was working in the hospitals, it said, when you have an Aboriginal patient come in, just whatever their age says on the label, add 20 to that. Because that's, you know, you're looking at, at disease prevalence in certain age groups, you know, they just seem to age faster. They get these diseases much more quickly than uh, European populations or Asian populations. That's why, you know, because they're only exposed to a Western diet, Western food, diseases of the West a few hundred years ago. They haven't had thousands and thousands of years to build this up. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of various people who will go, can't do that, that's too hard, just meat and salt and water. Ooh. So for those people, is there like a step step by down procedure or something like that that they could do where, you know, that the first step feels massive? And what, what would you recommend for those people? 
Yeah. Well, no, I, I definitely think that that's like, if someone's having trouble with that sort of, I'm sort of an all or nothing person. I see a plant you're trying to kill me, right? Get them out. I don't want that, you know, but, uh, not everybody, you know, understands it in the same way I do or thinks about it in the same way I do. And so, you know, that's fine. I just want people to understand that meat's not bad for you. Fat's not bad for you. It will not cause heart disease or diabetes. And so don't be afraid of it and you can and eat more of it. That should be the focus as opposed to you know, the other things. It's like salad's the focus and you have a bit of meat, but really that, no, 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 opposite. Okay. No, so I the know focus. this palm of your hand. Bullshit no, business. nonsense. <laughs> Yeah, if, my, if the palm of my hand is that big, then that's that's then that's yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you've got bare bare paws, yeah, then, exactly. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting because in Australia we had a campaign back in the seventies and eighties, which was called "Feed the Man Meat," and it was all about trying to get. It was run by the meat industry, trying to get men to eat more meat. But in fact, I think it should have been called "Feed the Woman Meat," because women are iron deficient. We have horrendous menstrual problems, which are getting worse and worse with endometriosis and polycystic ovarian syndrome. The plethora of iron deficient women who are sick and tired in their, in their youth, you know, in their twenties and thirties, who are avoiding red meat because they think it's bad for them or that. And then what happens is they don't grow up with the, the taste of it. So then, then they'll say to me, oh, no, I just don't like the taste. And it's like, mm. mm-hmm. so yeah, I reckon it should have been feed the woman meat. Yeah, yeah, just feed the people meat, and uh, you know, yeah. Kelly Hogan has a shirt that says "Eat the meat, save the humans." You know, as opposed to like you know, save the animals. You know, but to answer your question, I think a good step down is just eating more meat and and focusing on the fat and and just going keto. You know, I mean, there are certain things I think that are worse than others, and I think sugar, alcohol, and carbohydrates are top of that list. You know, because those things they can cause direct harm, but. Also, what they do is, is they kick you out of what I think of as our primary metabolic state. I do think that what we call, uh, refer to as a, as a fasting state is actually our primary metabolic state. That's the primary metabolic state of nearly all animals in the wild and humans in the wild because we're just eating meat. We're not eating a bunch of carbs naturally. And that's where all of our heavy machinery comes to bear. The only reason we call a carbohydrate insulin, you know, hyperinsulinemic state as a, as a fed state, as our primary state is because by the time we were looking, able to look at biochemistry at a molecular level, everyone was eating carbohydrates anyway. And so they said, oh, when you eat, it looks like this. And when you don't eat, it looks like that. Not failing to recognize that when you eat anything at all, except carbohydrates, it also looks like you're fasting. And so when I eat 5,000 calories of ribeye in one sitting, I am not fasting. You know, and so my my metabolism should not be called a fasting metabolism because it's not. And so I think that you have so much harm done by just clicking over into that incorrect metabolism. Your body's trying to protect you from hyperglycemia, which is directly damaging your body through glycation. And so your body's like, okay, we need to protect this. We need to slam up your insulin to try to protect ourselves here. And that high insulin state causes a lot of disruption to your body and your mechanism. So I think that's a very important first step is getting rid of carbs, sugar, and alcohol. After that, there are certain vegetables and, and things that are a bit more and worse than others. Obviously, there's so many non-edible plants out there that you could call vegetables, leafy green vegetables. I mean, you make a salad out of hemlock leaves, and like that's not going to last too long. And, um, <laughs> you know, yes. so most, most plants will kill you. And that's something that, you know, you, you get lost in the woods. People know that. Well, you can't just eat any random plant, you know, and, uh, or at least the people still living know that. <laughs> and so there are, there are certain things that, that are just worse than others. And of the food that we eat, things like nightshades would be at the top of that list. So potatoes, tomatoes, eggplants, peppers, capsicums, all of these things are in the nightshade family. And, and traditionally, we would peel potatoes and we would vine ripen them blanch them, take the skin off, take the seeds out. And this would reduce and minimize the amount of solanine and other toxins from, from the nightshades that get into you. We've completely gone away with that. Oh yeah, we, we pick them when they're not ripe, when they're still green. There are studies showing that that doesn't actually get rid of the poisons. When, the, when a fruit is not ripe, the plant does not want you to eat it. The seed is not ready yet. And so it is harder, it's, it's more difficult to bite into, and it has more toxins and defense chemicals. And then if it vine ripens, the plant will pull out some of those toxins. There'll still be some in there, most of them in the skin and in the seeds. 
because a seed is a plant's baby, just like a bean and a seed and a nut and all these sorts of things. These are plants' babies, and that's where you'll find the highest concentration of, of toxins generally. And so traditionally, when the very poor people of Mesoamerica and South America were eating tomatoes, they were doing it in that way. They were vine ripening them, taking the skin off, taking the seeds out. And that's what the original pasta sauces in Spain, Portugal, and Italy were doing as well. And then we thought, oh, well, actually the skin, that's where all the nutrients are. That's where all the vitamins are. It's like, yeah, well, it's where all the poisons are too. Is the barrier protection that the plant is using to stop insects from boring into it. And so this is why we always peeled potatoes and took the skins off of, of tomatoes and vine ripened them. You know, this was, this was a folk history understanding that green tomatoes were poisonous. You don't eat green tomatoes, you know, and they'll be, oh, well, that's just silly. That's just being a silly, you know, it's just like, well, no, <laughs> you know, these people, there's a saying that, you know, you, you don't tear down a fence until you know why it was put up. Right. And so you were doing things in very certain ways, you know, even corn, they, they would go through uh, in Mesoamerica, they would go through a process of nishtamalization to extract more of the nutrients and break these bonds that we don't have the enzymes to break to free up things like niacin that are very abundant in corn, but is not available to us. We cannot extract it with our own natural design because we're not designed to eat it. So you have to go through these chemical processes to extract that and reduce some of the poisons. And then the Europeans took corn and just said, oh, okay, well, we can just eat corn. And they, they forgot. They said like, ah, we don't need to do that whole laborious process. We'll just do it. And so people were dying of pellagra, of niacin deficiency, you know, all across Europe and America, eating something that has a ton of niacin in it, which is quite ironic, but you know, that was the thing. It's not available to us unless you chemically process it because we're not able to chemically process it ourselves, which tells you we're not supposed to eat this stuff. And so I think that's the main thing to look at. Get rid of carbs and sugar and alcohol, get rid of, of nightshades. And then also a lot of different plants will have different toxins than other ones will different families of plants, you know, toxins run in families and plants like nightshades. They, they all make solanine like belladonna and tobacco and, and tomatoes. And so, you know, you shouldn't eat like the same vegetables and plants, like on a daily basis, you should switch it up because our bodies do have a capacity to detoxify some of these things to a certain extent, but you can overload yourself. So if you focus on meat, focus on fat, cut out the real nasty ones like carbs, sugar, alcohol, and nightshades, and then cycle the other vegetables that you eat, you're going to be doing a lot better. And obviously no beans or legumes, any seeds or nuts or any, any plant babies, just stay away from. Yep. Yep. Gosh, it's amazing. It's so amazing. And I think it's, you know, I love the idea that, you know, there's all different ways that people can look at what they're doing. And, you know, we always have this idea that everything's an experiment. So, you know, if the idea of doing carnivore appeals to you, but, you know, but part of your brain's going, oh, but it's too hard. I don't think I could do it. Well, then I always go, well, just do an experiment. Just try it for 30 days and see how you feel. And, you know, you've got your 30 day challenge. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So that that's the do exactly that because I, I agree with you. I think that, you know, people should just try it and just understand just how much better they're going to feel after about two weeks of just being on meat and water you get most of this garbage out of your system and you will literally feel like a different breed of human. Your body was just like, I had no idea I could ever feel this good, you know? And I, I remember when I, when I did this again and I was doing this consciously and after two weeks, I was like, I just felt so amazing. And I looked back on the rest of my life and realized like, I felt like garbage my whole life. That's a problem. I don't like that. And so when you get that, you get about two weeks Alcohol takes about three weeks to get out of your system, but most other things will be, it will be well and truly out of your system in about two weeks. And then your body really starts getting into the stream of things and you just feel amazing. You just, your body works different than what it has ever uh, done before. You feel better than you ever have before. And so then you have a good two weeks of just feeling amazing. And you will, most people will lose a significant amount of weight in that time. Um, you know, a lot of that's going to be you know, inflammation and water weight and things like that, but it will be fat as well. Uh, and then they'll continue to lose fat and put on muscle and just feel amazing. And so just experiencing that for at least a couple of weeks, right? Because two weeks it takes to get this garbage out of your system. And then you're like, okay, now I'm in my Zen moment. I feel just amazing. And having a couple of weeks of that, where you just feel like a superhero, 
you know, that's a good feeling. And, and for me, that's not a feeling that I want, that I ever plan on losing. And so like, I have just no interest in eating anything else. And I have sampled things back in me. Like, oh, okay. Well, what does this do to me? Like, no, 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 no. I don't want that. You know, my face is getting itchy. My, you know, I started to get like wheezy and things like that. You know, I was like, oh, no, I don't like that. And so, you know, for me, I'm just like, I have a, a complete aversion to all those sorts of things. And so it's just to let people experience that. And I've, I've had a number of people that do that, like that lady you know, who, who's Native American. She's like, I, I had no idea. I had no idea. It was just spices. She was only eating meat for her life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, you know? yes. And, and 40 years, literally 40 years of exclusively eating meat. Oh, you can't do that. It's not sustainable. You don't get the nutrients. Well, entire civilizations do it today, you know, like like the Inuit living naturally in the Nanette, the Maasai and all these others. And so this lady was doing that. And just the spices were causing four. She had four autoimmune diseases they're gone now, you know, they've just gone away. And so just trying that and just experiencing that so many people like, I had no idea. You know, I had no idea I could feel this good. And, you know, some people were like, I'm really glad I did that. That was a total reset. I just feel amazing. I have incorporated, I do eat some plants, but I'm just focusing on meat and things like that. And that works better for me. And I'm like, great. That's awesome. At least, you know, now, you know, and you can, and if you have something out of your system, and you sample it back in and you go like, ah, I guess it affects me, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not too fussed. Fine. You know, that's that's fine. But at least you know now, whereas before you didn't. And so some things you'll add back in. Like, well, no, that doesn't agree with me. I don't really like that. You know, and so you can do that with more data, with more information, make a more informed decision with your life. Yeah. Everything is just an experiment. I love it. I love it. Anthony, it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you today. I will link all of your Patreon page and the links that we've talked about earlier in the show. I'll pop them in the show notes um, so people can connect with you. And if they want to connect with you on socials, what are your socials names? Yeah, so um, my Instagram is is just Anthony Chafee MD, uh, as is my YouTube channel and my Patreon and um, I think TikTok. Well, and that horrible yeah. thing. <laughs> Um, and then the, the 38 challenge is just, uh, the website's just how to carnivore.com. And, uh, and that's just, you know, just gives people added support. And we have a telegram group where we chat and answer questions and have weekly zoom meetings and things like that. And have, uh, people have access to online modules and information and educational packets and things like that. And so people can, can check those out. Um, everything's linked through my Instagram and YouTube pages. And there's like a link tree with all the rest of that. If people want to check those out. Perfect. We'll put it, the links in the show notes. And uh, Chafee is spelled C-H-A-F-F-E. That's correct. Awesome. All right. Well, we look forward to connecting with you at the Low Carb Road Show. So if you are lucky enough to live in Perth, you will be able to come and hear Anthony speak live on tips and traps for carnivore eating. And we are overwhelmed with excitement about that. Yeah, me too. Have the most wonderful day and uh, we will catch up with you soon. So, my lovely listeners, that ends this episode of Real Health and Weight Loss. I'm Dr. Lucy Burns. And I'm Dr. Mary Barson. We're from Real Life Medicine. To contact us, please visit rlmedicine.com. And until next time, thanks thanks for for listening. listening. The information shared on the Real Health and Weight Loss podcast, including show notes and links, provides general information only. It is not a substitute, nor is it intended to provide individualized medical advice, diagnosis or treatment, nor can it be construed as such. Please consult your doctor for any medical concerns.